Welcome to another episode of the Bank Free Blueprint. And today I have with me Arvel Hedrick. Welcome, Arvel. How are you doing, Tom? I'm doing well, thanks. It, it, you and I have had a chance to uh, talk on a couple other episodes, and I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, join us here again. Today we want to talk a bit about a couple of deals, maybe some uh, about deal structuring uh, as it relates to either the borrower-lender relationship or a joint venture relationship. Uh, but first of all, you are out of Austin, Texas, and you're with Turnkey Capital Group. Could you just share with our audience the types of properties that you like to focus on or the types of real estate investing that you like to focus on? Okay, so basically, uh, we fund projects that are residential and also commercial. The residential side are basically non-owner occupied, single family residences, one to four units. Uh, commercial, basically, it, it could be anything from a land development project to a community or uh, maybe a commercial strip center of that type. Uh, those are the kind of projects that we kind of look at. And, and basically, the dollar amount could be anywhere from 100000 all the way up to $5 million. Okay, great, great. And y- y- we, we talk on this show about both a joint venture relationship and a borrower lender relationship when we're talking with uh, either brokers, uh, hard money brokers, private money lenders, that type of thing. What, uh, which one do you focus on mainly? So we, we focus mostly on the borrower lender relationship Mm -hmm. and basically it is still a joint venture, but basically our investor that's working with us is a borrower. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, I like to call it a joint venture type of a relationship with a borrower, but it's a borrower-lender structure. Would you say that's yes, accurate? Yes, it is. Okay, great, great. And uh, w- you're out of Austin, Texas. Your company is. You and your wife, Deb, run the company. And could you share with us what markets you like to invest in? Do you stay local to that area? Do you expand out to different areas? What, what's your market? So our market is basically Hawaii, California, Texas. Uh, we are getting queries now out of the East Coast. Mm-hmm. Um, and we are looking at deals basically nationally. Yeah. So uh, it, basically out of Hawaii, we've gotten a few land development deals that are coming our way. Um, California, there, we've had a couple of borrowers through our real estate investment networks that we work with. Mm-hmm. Uh, we get a lot of queries from borrowers there as well. I and see. We're familiar with those particular uh, investment systems. Uh, we're, we're, we're much more aware of the type of uh, rigor that these particular investors put around uh, basically uh, underwriting their own deal. Mm-hmm. So that by the time it gets to us, they can tell us exactly what their construction costs are going to be, what the purchase price, these things. And there's really no gray area. Yeah. You want to make sure that you've got all the, all of the details worked out. And, and I can imagine, uh, at least from my experience, that it does take a little bit of different set of maybe underwriting criteria, a uh, different bit of uh, maybe uh, different types of uh, due diligence that gets added on to the typical due diligence when it is something that is located out of your local market. How has that been for you? And what, what, what are your thoughts? What can you share for any of the listeners as to how, if somebody wants to maybe invest outside of their area, what would be a couple of things you might suggest based on what you've learned? Number one is find someone uh, who's very good at doing the construction control on the project for you. Mm -hmm. This particular type of outsourced service, we utilize uh, third-party vendors. And uh, we're familiar with them. More times than not, we know the particular company on our local level. And they basically have told us, look, we can handle the inspections and handle these items uh, in Hawaii, in California. So it it basically has kind of helped us uh, since... More times than not, 
the inspection and the, and uh, are they're going to inspect the property exactly the same way they would here in Texas, and then they would also make us aware of, uh, for instance, maybe things we may not uh, encounter here in Texas. Uh, mm -hmm in the form of natural disasters like earthquakes or something like that in mm -hmm. California, we don't necessarily have that issue here, although we do have hurricanes. Mm -hmm. And the same could be said in Hawaii with, uh, you know, for instance, tsunamis. So those are things we wouldn't necessarily see in central Texas. Mm -hmm. So even though you don't have a, a full uh, team that w that is an inter inner office team, it's more of a, collaborative team that you put together a, a um, uh, affiliates and uh, service providers that you bring together that are able to cover all of those particular checklist items that need to be covered in order to make sure that the deals are done safely and profitably, right? Correct. And, and basically it, what we've been able to do is leverage our own local contacts Mm -hmm. You may have local contacts in these areas that we're working in. Uh, we have an attorney who's work, who has a great deal of uh, expertise in the West Pacific because initially when he came out of uh, his law school, that's where he was doing business was in Guam, of all mm -hmm. places. And naturally, he was handling foreclosures for companies like uh, uh, Brown and Root. Uh, I want to say Toyo was another company he had mentioned in the past that he was handling foreclosures in uh, in Hawaii, in Tonga, in these different areas that I, I would never have imagined. So he has already relationships with local companies there that he's been able to put us in contact from a title perspective, from a also uh, maybe perhaps a uh, escrow uh, perspective as well. Mm -hmm. So these things have kind of worked into our favor and. You know, it kind of takes away the fear now in that, wow, you know, here's someone we never would have imagined who's got this experience that we're able to leverage. So you've created a good, solid relationship with someone, brought them on basically as a team member, somebody who can fill in any of those, the, the gaps that might be there because it is a bit more remote investment. Exactly. And, and it's also through our private lender network that we've been able to also utilize and find the contacts that we need uh, in these areas that we're operating in. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really been, I think, the difference with us and other private lenders is, well, I don't want to go necessarily go into that area because I don't know who the title companies are. I don't know who the appraisers are. Mm -hmm. So, because of the fact that we do work with multiple lenders, not just here locally, but also in California, Southern California, the Bay Area, and of course, Hawaii, we're able to make those connections and contacts that we need to. Yeah. So it, again, it's about creating that. It's a collaboration, working together, building that really strong team so that even though you aren't there every day or every week, you know that someone on your team, someone has has that ability and the responsibility to to take care of the projects, make sure they're running running smooth. I know one of the things we do, we always uh, we've we've invested maybe in about a dozen or maybe closer to fourteen states, and uh, we've done so. We've done a fair amount of remote remote investing, but we always make sure that one, either myself, my business partner or uh, someone on our team has gone out to the property or, or goes out to the property, depending on what it is, on a relatively regular basis. So there is travel involved in, in, in a lot of cases in our, in our business. Is that, how, how do you treat that? How do you do that? Uh, basically, we, we will make a visit out to these particular projects and mm -hmm. we will basically make sure that, is this feasible, um, you know, if that's not possible, for instance, mm -hmm. then once again, it's leveraging someone within our private lender network who can. Yeah. So that we, we may share something in common as far as our basic tenants and uh, that commonality basically in doing risk mitigation at the forefront 
at the front end instead of waiting until later on for something to happen. Uh, that that that's a big that's a big plus on our side. Gotcha. Good. Good. Should we go? Uh, should we have a little discussion about a, a project that uh, I think you called me about a week and a half ago, maybe two weeks ago? It was a, a developer. Uh, actually, it was a buyer. It was a woman that had made an offer or was ready to make an offer on a property. And she had asked you some questions. And I thought this would be an interesting opportunity to talk a little bit about how the conversations went, kind of some of the different things we talked about. So would you mind just explaining, first of all, who the person, uh, like who that developer borrower was, what her goals were, and then maybe a little bit about the property and how you connected with her. Okay, so basically I, we received a phone call uh, from a borrower uh, and it was basically a, a, uh, answering one of our Facebook ads. It was just, you know, she said, I have this deal. I'm not sure what to do. Um, how do I fund it? And she was a relatively new investor who is a, who's in law enforcement. Her name's Kimberly. She was uh, from uh, the Palm Springs area of California. Mm -hmm. she, she's a law enforcement officer who basically is relatively new to uh, real estate investing. And, but, you know, the fact that, you know, she's already starting out and finding deals and, you know, basically being as aggressive as she can um, she called me up. We took a look at her deal and the loan to value might have, was a, a bit high for us to be able to fund. However, what we wanted to do to maintain and build this relationship with her was assist her in helping her basically win the deal. Mm -hmm. uh, the, this particular situation was this particular property had been vacant for 12 to 15 years. Um, the, I, I believe the purchase price was about uh, about four hundred thousand. Very large estate, uh, an acre and a half. Uh, house was about forty five hundred square feet. She had grown up in this area, and knew about the house, and uh, basic. What it was was she was coming into a situation where there were multiple offers on the property, and she wanted to find a way. How can my offer either be differentiated apart or, or basically lack of a better term can be um, stand out from the rest. Mm -hmm. And so I, I thought about this and I said, you know what, let me call one of my partners, uh, Tom Bregelman, and let's, let's kind of run this past him. He's got 30 years of real estate experience. Um, I'm sure he can come up with a relatively quick way that, we can structure a deal quickly and kind of help, help you stand out from the rest. I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so we, with that, we, well, first of all, I thought it was interesting that you went the extra step of helping her figure out a way to make it happen. Even though if I remember right, you said that the numbers uh, weren't, weren't quite there for you or you weren't sure if they were quite there for you. Is that right? Right. We, we, it was kind of, you know, how can we structure this deal? And even though let's, if we can't fund the deal for her or, or, or basically if we're not, even though we may not be the lender on this deal, let's assist her in making sure that she can win this deal. Mm -hmm. uh, basically create a win-win for all of us. And even though we may not be the lender in at this time, let's make sure that uh, we build a relationship with her that can be ongoing and that she would see that uh, we do bring value to the table and she'll look at us for other deals. Yeah. And that, that, that's, that's what I think is really important is a lot of times we, we end up giving probably more than, than we necessarily need to in some cases, but, what I've certainly found out, and I think you have too, is that when you give a lot, you get a lot back. And so it's all part of that collaborative working together. You know, uh, there's plenty out there for everybody. If we all work together, we can get a lot done. And so I, 
I just thought that was great that you were willing to go that extra step. So, so you called me and we had a, a brief discussion before we got on the phone with her. And you shared with me just a bit of detail about it. And uh, yeah, so she was wondering, she was looking at ways to make her offer come better than others. And I mean, in potentially better than others with, without it just being totally based on price. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, uh, number one, I, I, I like the fact that during our conversation, you immediately said, let's get back to the basics. You know, does she know who the, the who the sellers are? Is she communicating with the sellers? Mm -hmm. What is the seller's motivation? And it basically was just real estate investing 101. I love the way we, you were saying, how can we, let's get back to the basics. And number one, let's find out the motivation of the sellers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and with that, it's really typically, it's either going to be price or terms. And what I, what I generally look at when it's, and this was an estate that was being settled. The seller, I, I believe, was a, a, an estate. So it was Correct. a family. And we started talking about just learning a little bit more about what their motivations were for selling. And she didn't have all the answers, but she certainly had some questions to go back with. And some of the questions that, I, that came to my mind right away were, what what does she have a, a sense of that they are going for? Are they looking for top dollar or are they looking for a very simple, quick exit? Because if it's top dollar, there are definitely different ways of approaching it than if it's just an immediate close where they really want it to close quickly. And a couple of the signs that I look for when, when that question is asked or when I'm asking that question is how many people are in the estate. So if there's six, seven, eight, nine people in the estate that's selling the property, some are sometimes they're more motivated to just get out, get the money out and just make it a quick sale. Because in the end, when it's split up between more people, it isn't, you know, it isn't necessarily as much per person. But so that was one one indicator. So if it if it gets divided up between so many, it also creates a lot more moving parts for for them to all come together on an agreement. So a lot of times it's whatever can be done quickest. But on the other hand, if they're looking for top dollar, then there there are different ways of looking that at, at that as well. And so she didn't she wasn't sure which it was correct. That's correct. She was not sure. Uh basically the size of the estate or how many people were involved on the deal on the other side. Mm -hmm. And the only communication she had was through her, her agent, uh, back to the selling agent. Mm -hmm. so that was her next step. She was going to go back and, and work with her agent to find out, okay, what is it they want? Mm -hmm. And, and kind of go take that next step. Yeah. And so we talked a bit about how, how she might be able to approach her agent so that she can kind of fill the agent in and why she's asking certain questions, why she's trying to get to a, a certain, uh, certain set of answers that will make it easier for her to determine what the target is. Is it a quick close? Is it a, a top dollar? If one of the things we talked about, well, maybe if it's a top dollar that she's looking for, and, and there were there were a couple other offers in on the property, right? Or there were right. there were others coming in, and so and hers was not going to be the highest based on what she what she was uh, um, estimating at the time, right? That's correct. She yeah. she knew hers was not going to be the highest, mm -hmm. and and so one of the things that you had recommended is say. Well, one, uh, one uh, strategy we could utilize is basically, can they wait until after you've completed the rehabilitate, the rehab mm -hmm. to basically come back and now pay them not only their asking price, also a portion of the profits after she sells the property, mm -hmm. after, yeah. after she's completed the rehab. Yep. And, and, and possibly 
And, and the reason that I, that I like doing it that way in, in some cases is it, it creates more of an alignment to what the end result is. Uh, I'll, I'll run a real quick example here of a deal that we had a while back where somebody had, had approached me, I was mentoring them and they had approached me about a project that was, um, the agent really felt that it was a very good deal, very good price on the property it needed X amount of renovations. And once it was done, it would sell for this certain dollar amount. And uh, I looked, I went over the numbers with the person I was working with and I just, I didn't see it. I didn't see that it wasn't necessarily a bad deal, but it wasn't a deal that was, that had as much margin in, in it as I thought was really necessary in order for everybody to come out well on the project. And so, I, I, I told him, I told the, the gentleman I was mentoring, I said, you know, maybe I, I would pass on it. So he went back, he, he talked to the agent to see if, if there was anything else they could do to get the offer, to get the property, because he really, he really wanted to do the project. And uh, the agent said, he just had another long discussion with the agent and they just felt that it absolutely was there or the agent kept telling him that the value is there. It's going it, to, it'll, it's a great deal. Why, why, why do you think it's not a great deal? And so he came back to me and I said, well, I still don't think it's necessarily where it's at, but why don't you just, just check it out. See, see how much he's willing to stand behind what he's saying. He meaning the real estate agent. Right. <laughs> and so what I suggested was why doesn't he, say that he's willing to make the offer on the property and what he'd like to do is have have the agent get paid half of the commission that they normally would get paid get that paid up front and then the other half when the property sells but actually double that other half so he gets one and a half times as much as he normally would so, um, so up front, he'd get half of what the commission was on the back end. When it sold, he'd get the other half plus it would be doubled. So, and he went back to the agent with that offer and the agent said, absolutely not. He didn't, he, he didn't bat an eye. He said, absolutely not. I will not do that. And to me that, that was a reflection of what they really felt about the property because that would have been a, a very substantial commission up, up uptick for them to be able to get uh, for that agent to get. But the minute that there was any bit of risk of not getting all of that, that to me would be at least a, an indication that maybe it's not exactly what that person was representing or, or whatever. So, so exactly. to, what that did is it, it sort of, it, it aligns everybody so that everybody is ending for that aim, that end goal of the best project possible alignment and uh, collaboration. But if it doesn't work for one person, it, it won't work for the rest. And so in this case, what we talked about was how about if, if they really want to get top dollar on the property, then maybe, maybe they could carry back some of their equity while the property was being completed, it, their, their equity would still be secured by the property. But if there truly was that sort of upside that the sellers believed that there was, then let them share in the upside as well. So they, they wouldn't get paid everything up front. They would carry a note for part of, part of the equity or part of what they believe is equity in the property. But then in the end, they would also share in some more of the upside than what the what even the other offers were that were coming in. And so it's a way to, to really compensate people for the risk, compensate people for what they're bringing to the deal. And it, it really helps balance it out. So uh, and, uh, any thoughts on that, Arvel? Um, basically, it, I, I, I thought that this particular phone call and working with you was uh, an excellent, an example of learning of that emotional intelligence that we need to know is what is motivating this person on the other side, mm -hmm. on either the selling or the buying side for that matter. 
And uh, that was a big lesson for me. Yeah, and I think it, I think it comes with time where, where we, uh, at least from my perspective, what I always try to look for is what would I like to see if I was on the other side? If I was the one selling the property, what would, it, what would be a good solution for me? And so anytime that we're structuring deals with sellers or we're structuring deals with uh, joint venture partners, whatever the situation might be, I always look at it as, would I be happy to be on the other side? And I use this example in my book, The, um, the Bank Free Blueprint, where um, when, when my twin brother and I were kids, five, six years old, uh, mom would cut an orange in half or cut a cupcake in half, and then there'd be squabbling over who gets which half because one might be bigger than the other. So what she would do is, um, especially on the cupcake, because it wasn't a sharp knife, but she'd give one of us a knife and the other one could pick. And what better way to do it than, than that? If, if one person gets to cut it, then the other person gets to pick. So that, that's how you can really make it about as fair as possible. So I, when, when we look at it from that perspective, just really making sure that it's, would I be happy on the other side of what I'm offering? then to me, that's how, how we can get the closest possible uh, to, to the solution that we're aiming for. So, um, so do you know what, what, whatever happened? Did, uh, did she make the offer? I, I haven't, you and I haven't talked about this. So uh, the last we heard was she had made the offer. It was turned down. I believe they want uh, the cash up front. Mm -hmm. it, was, it did turn out that this was a larger group in the estate. It was about six people. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it didn't necessarily work well for her, but she did appreciate the fact that we did go the extra mile with her. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we are looking at other deals now with her. Yeah, good, good. And I'm based on the conversation the three of us had, I think, I mean, it, it, she seems like she's – She's got a lot of experience. She has a lot of uh, um, a lot of energy. Um, she has the wherewithal to to get the job done. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if you get another phone call here at some point with uh, more projects that she has for you to take a look at. So, oh, definitely, definitely. Yeah. So I guess uh, again, the point just being, what what would we like to see if we we're on the other side? Is number one, uh, and number two is what what makes it um, what, what way can we set it up so that there's the best possible outcome for everybody? And by whether it's by sharing the upside because of sharing the risk or whatever it is, it, there, there are just a lot of different ways of looking at it, different ways of structuring deals so that in the end, everybody can come out with a better, safer, more profitable deal. So. Exactly. Um, um Oh, go ahead. So recently there was a, we were facing a lot of challenges on some of the smaller deals that were, let's say uh, the ARV was definitely over a hundred thousand, but let's say the loans and the properties were in such a distressed state, distressed state. Mm -hmm. that basically we thought that we wouldn't be able to use a joint venture model, mm -hmm. but after going through the deal with a with uh, a couple of our borrowers, one uh, one couple, for instance, Robert and Yvonne, mm -hmm. they're out of a tertiary market of uh, let's say uh, out right in between Austin and San Antonio, mm -hmm. and they she's she's constantly bringing me deals that or let's say you know construction purchase or sub one hundred thousand. Um, you know, after we look at the numbers, they may not necessarily be the greatest, but as we started to see that she kept bringing us more and more deals, I looked at a way at saying, hey, look, here's a way we could possibly do a blanket loan to you on three properties mm -hmm. coming in with the same amount of down payment. You might have to come in with one amongst all three and look at what we can do. We can fund 100% of the purchase price, your construction, and look at what your profit's now going to look like on these three 
three properties. Mm -hmm. And that was a huge win for us and also our borrower. So it, it, this is one of the things that, uh, you know, it, it just came down to simple deal structuring and basically not looking at each particular property as its own self-contained deal, but how can we leverage one property amongst another mm -hmm. uh, that they, they purchased outright and, and basically do them all at one time? Ah, yeah. And, and the, I think what you do in that case would be to cross collateral and do a blanket mortgage, right? That's what you said. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what we're looking at doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Is so that we're able to leverage one property against the other two, uh, still minimizes their, the down payment they're, they're coming into as 10% spread over the, th the uh, three properties. And combined with the equity and the uh, other uh, property that they're, they're cross collateralizing, it brings down the down payment down to a minimal amount. Right, right. So you've got the, you've got the, yeah, so you've got the, you've got the adequate collateral like any other deal would have. It's just that you're using other cross collateral or uh, other property as cross collateral. And, um, and, and because of that, because of those sort of creative structuring techniques, you're also doing more of the, the equity share or the profit sharing, right? Exactly. They initially, her thought process was basically, um, I think what I'm going to do is just take this particular property and wholesale it. And then I looked at him uh, at all the deals as a whole and then thought for a moment and said, what if you could do all three properties uh, and this would be your down payment for another, you know, $5,000 more. What would you do then? She go, well, I would do all three. Uh -huh. I said, then why don't we do all three? Mm -hmm. And part of the reason you were able to do that, I believe, would be because the projects were small enough where it wasn't just a huge amount of risk by putting a ton of money out for, for uh, bigger projects. Is that correct? Exactly. That, mm -hmm. That's correct. Yeah. So, yeah, there's just a lot of different ways to, uh, to structure things. I think it's really, it's about making sure that we're able to identify all the risks and to the extent possible, be able to mitigate any and all of those risks. And I just think it's so important to be able to really look at projects very pragmatically and very, uh, very subjective, uh, subjectively, um, yeah. and um, be very careful and, and always willing to walk away from a deal because if, if like in your case, if you're the lender, like we're the lender, um, if we, if we're not walking away from deals that are marginal, that may not be good, may not be the best, even if, even if there's a small profit made, but not, not what we're aiming for, we're really not doing that developer any favors either, because that's going to be a major drain on them and their resources. And it's going to, it's just, it's not a good situation. So the more that we can help them see why it's a good deal or why it's not a good deal and how we can share our expertise on risk mitigation, knowing where the pitfalls could be, knowing where the, where the issues could be and what ways those risks can be mitigated. That's really what I feel is definitely part of our responsibility to, to our, uh, uh, active investor partners or joint venture partners or borrowers, whatever, whatever the structure may be. So um, always being able to look at things just very practically and being able to walk away from them, I think is, is really important. So um, Arvel, what, if you were to say, I always like asking for resources and what would you say would be, a resource that you've used or that you would recommend that any of our listeners could get value from, whether maybe it's a book you've read, maybe it's, uh, uh, you know, it might be some instructional videos or it might be, you know, what, anything, does anything come to mind where, where some of the listeners could, could get some value? 
one particular book I read recently that's really given me a lot of value and uh, and made me look uh, inwardly, um, uh, basically from how I carry myself as a leader is uh, the book called Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willink. Mm. So that's uh, that's a very good book. And it was just really interesting that one of our ALA brothers, Peter Tunley, was actually on his team. Mm -hmm. so, wow. Yeah. And it's Extreme Ownership? Extreme Ownership. Uh, I believe it's a, I forget the second part, a, a SEAL a SEAL's Guide to Leadership. Ah, uh, and, and what we'll do for anybody who, who may be driving while you're listening to this podcast, don't write it down. We'll have it in the, in the show notes so that you can uh, pull it up, but we'll make sure we get that listed. And, uh, there, one other uh, book, though, is also, I believe it's the uh, Inner Game of private, uh, a private Money. Oh, okay. That uh, one. I think Willie Hooks wrote that one. Mm -hmm. I... And, I do remember that one. Yes. Yeah. Willie is a, a, an amazing uh, uh, coach and mentor for sure. No, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. So we'll, we'll put both of those on as uh, resources. So if anybody has a chance to read those and Arvilla, if, if someone would like to reach out to you to connect with you, has questions for you, how would, how would they be able to reach you? Uh, basically, uh, they could call me at area code 512-655-3250. Also, uh, our web link is www.turnkeycapitalgroup.com. Turnkey Capital Group is all one word. Great, great. And uh, that we will also have that in the show notes. So, um, yeah, great. Well, thank you, Arvel. This has been a, a real pleasure. Thank you for sharing your time and your expertise and look forward to another uh, another session soon. Thanks a lot, Tom. I'm really happy to, I really appreciate being on the call with you today. And it's always a pleasure. Great. Thank you.